What's up everybody? How y'all doing today? This is Chapel. It's your boy. I'm back. I know it's been about a year. Uh, just wanted to say sorry about that. I had to take a hiatus. Had some other stuff going on. But uh, we're back today with another video. Today uh, I'm going to be going over how to make a chaotic evil character in D&D &D and how to properly do that. Because a lot of people, well, they just don't know how to do it. So we're going to be going over the character Lorne Malvo from Fargo. All right. I think at, at some point we've all wanted to make an evil character for D&D, &D, a chaotic evil character. We figured it would be a lot of fun, but we wound up doing some chaotic stupid things with it. Okay. So first we're going to start off with some examples because we need some good examples of what a good chaotic evil character is like. Let's look at our first example. Demons. When arriving on the material plane, demons have a reputation for going on a rampage and killing indiscriminately. This, however, is not always the case, as they do kill uh, and torment for the purpose of entertainment. Um, if you can be of use to them, and you're strong enough to fight back, mutual benefit is most often their primary means of continued existence on the material plane. An example of this can be found in the book The Crystal Shard, where Ertu chooses to work with a wizard, Akar Kessel, for the eventual benefit of gaining Crenshinibon, an artifact that bestows incredible amounts of power onto its wielder. Looking at our next examples, the Drow Society and Menzo Baranzon, and the construction of which uh, it's based upon. The Drow also act in mutual benefit of one another, um, not just randomly going around killing one another and whoever's whoever else may cross the path. For them, if you are useful, you are allowed to live. If you become useless, you are therefore a liability and must be eliminated. Menzo Baranzon is a city ruled by the drow, with the noble houses ruling over the common houses, and then each house has a hierarchy of position and a rank in the city. The hierarchy within each house reflects this blueprint. At the head of each house is a matron mother, Directly beneath her are the priestesses of Loth. Usually the matron's daughters, sisters, sometimes the matron's nieces, <coughs> regardless of whether they are adopted or biological. Then you have the weapons master and the house patron, if the house has one. These are the highest levels of authority granted to males in drow society, as females are almost always put forth to become clerics of Loth. Loth is the Spider Queen deity of the Drow. She makes sure that the matriarchy of the Drow is kept in power. <clears throat> no males ever rise to a position of power. This also means that regardless of if a male is ranked above her, the female will always have the last say. The weapons master is truly the highest actual authority given to given to males, as the position of the house patron means nothing more than the male the matron mother sleeps with. This position has no real authority other than that which is on the surface of it. After them are the other clerics and wizards of the house. Again, the women are always considered to be the betters of the males, despite the truth of the abilities of each individual. Below them are the drow commoners, and below them are the Ibleth slaves. Ibleth meaning anything not drow, and also meaning shit. The house, or rather each house, vies to gain power through positions and acts of accolades to increase their reputation and power. At first glance, this seems like a system of order, however it is in fact a system of chaos as each house is effectively in a cold war with every other house in the city. The law that keeps pretense of order in place is the law of drow justice. It states that any house that attacks another must be completely annihilated. Therefore, open wars are to be avoided and secret attacks on houses occur with the attacker and the defender knowing that the defender must be completely wiped out or all of the city will destroy the attacking house. Therefore, because even if one member of the <coughs> of the noble house survives, 
the attacking house will be completely annihilated. This makes for an interesting powers that be rule that takes place, where the ruling houses have to be powerful enough to be able to fight off as many three or four other houses that might band together to overthrow them. Another way to examine <coughs> to examine this would be to use the example of the Sith from Star Wars pre-Disney buyout. This example gives us the chaos behind the guise of order. Where the individual seeks to attain power within the structure by any means necessary, while trying at the same time to keep the structure as intact as possible so that they might use that structure to get what they want and destroy what they hate. Another misunderstanding about chaotic evil characters is the idea that they place little value on life. This simply isn't true. The truth of it is best exemplified by a quote found in the Star Wars book Fatal Alliance. People are replaceable. Seconds are not. Darth Kratos. This gives us the example that an evil character doesn't have the luxury of wasting time on things such as mercy and altruism. To them, the sacrifice of oneself means nothing, as others are meant to be sacrificed for them. Many see this as a license to murder literally anyone for any reason, for any short-term gain. This again is wrong, and here is why. A chaotic evil will recognize when they are being wasteful. Killing off someone they need for a specific reason, without a replacement, is foolish at best, and at worst, makes them look like an idiot. For example, if a thief has hired a wizard to scry the location of a weapon of a fabled hero, the thief <coughs> couldn't hire just any old wizard to do it. They have to hire a specific wizard for a specific item. And they can't just take their frustrations out on the wizard, killing them when he can't get the job done or he refuses to do it. Because it would take too long to find another wizard that knows the spell and he doesn't have the time for a different wizard to learn it. <clears throat> now that we have some proper examples of chaotic evil, let's look at the subject of this video, Lauren Malvo. Lorne serves as the primary antagonist for the first season of Fargo. If you haven't seen this show, I highly recommend it. Also, there's going to be a lot of spoilers after this, so if you haven't seen that show and you care about spoilers, I would strongly suggest you go watch the first season of Fargo, which is what we'll be covering in this video. I'm going to let you, let you do that, and once you're done, you can come back. All set? Okay, cool. All right. The purpose of this video is twofold. The first is an in-depth examination of Lauren's character throughout the first season of the show. The second is to give players of Dungeons and Dragons a template on which to build a chaotic evil character that the rest of your playgroup will not only allow to be in the game, but will enjoy playing with. Now, here we go. The first time we see Lorne is at the beginning of the first episode of the first season. Driving in a car in the middle of a snow-covered vista on a lone two-lane highway. Our first real glimpse of his character, as, uh, as to he is, is in this scene. After he hits a deer running across a road and crashes his car into a ditch, his, quote, cargo, a man he had kidnapped as part of a job he was hired for gets out of the trunk of the car with nothing on but his boots and his boxers and goes running off into the wilderness in the middle of the night in what I'm sure is below zero degree temperature as from my understanding it's mid-January in this scene. Leaving the man to his obviously doomed fate, Lorne picks up the deer and places it in the trunk of his car. His thoughts here are abundantly clear as he could have done several things with the deer, including making sure it was just off the road. However, he takes the deer and puts it in the trunk of his car. I believe there are two reasons for doing this. The first is quite simple. If the police investigate the car, he needs to contaminate the crime scene, and does so by placing the deer where the victim was being held. The second reason is to delay the investigation. When the police inevitably find the car, they will investigate and find that the and find the deer and assume that the frozen man a mile and a half in the wilderness is the driver. This provides a two or three days delay 
of an investigation where he will be followed. He knows he only has to stay ahead long enough for the trail to grow cold. This gives us an idea of how he thinks and how he can plan ahead on the spot. Now, the next time we see Lauren is the catalyst for the first season. His meeting with Lester, the other antagonist of the season. This is our first glimpse of his chaotic side. Though, its reasoning doesn't become apparent until after the fact. Mm. Excuse me, miss? Do you think, uh, will it be much longer that this thing hurts like the dickens? We'll call your name. Yeah, but I've been here an hour already. We'll call your name. Ugh. Can I have a sip? Oh. Heck, take the whole can. Can't drink the darn thing without a straw. Mm. What happened to your nose? Oh, it's, uh, it's just a misunderstanding. Now, was this you misunderstanding the other fellow or him misunderstanding you? Pardon? Who misunderstood whom? Oh, no, I, I, I'm saying... It's, uh, it's not good to dwell on these things. <laughs> Why? Pardon? Why is it not good to dwell on these things? Especially things that put you in the hospital. Uh, well, I was, <clears throat> I was outnumbered, if you want to know the truth. Three to one. I mean, big, big guys, too. Well, one of them. Other two are just kids, but big for their age, you know. If I was any kind of man, I'd have shown that Sam what's what. Sam? Yes. The bully in high school is a bully now. So why did. Join what's what? Well, his, he had his sons with him and... You let a man beat you in front of his children to send them a message? No, that's not... Heck. Just... Heck. In my experience, if you let a man break your nose, then next time he tries to break your spine, no way. Mm -mm. I mean, I, I don't think. It just, I, I guess I uh, embarrassed him in front of his boys. You embarrassed him? Yeah. By, uh, he, he was telling me about a time where he and my wife, they were. Uh, but he, he didn't know she was my wife, is the thing. And uh, when I told him. Look, this man slept with your wife, and you're worried about embarrassing him. Uh -uh, not slept. No, they, they didn't. Uh, it, he said it was just. She has soft hands, see, and uh, I guess no, I... Mister, we're not friends. I mean, maybe we will be someday. But I gotta say, if that were me in your position, I would have killed that man. Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> Four years. Gave me an 
Alistair? You know what? One, one time he put me in an oil barrel and rolled me in the road. Serious? And now he tells you that he had relations with your wife. He bullies you again in front of his children. This is a man who doesn't deserve to draw a breath. Yeah, okay. But, uh, here's the thing. No, that is the thing. Well, heck. I mean, okay. Okay. But what am I supposed to do? Heck, you're so sure about it, maybe you should just kill him for me. You're asking me to kill this man. No, that was, uh, I, I was joking. Mr. Nygaard? Uh, yeah, yeah that, that, that's, one, one second. We, 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 we're just two fellas talking, right? We're just blowing up steam. Sir, it's real busy. Like I said, one second. Sam, yes. No, just, just one second, that is not. Sir? Just one word. Yes or no? Sir, I'm going to give you a spot. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm coming for Pete's sake. Clearly, Lester has some problems. And Lorne, under the guise of the helpful stranger, starts talking to Lester. This act at first seems as though he has a moral compass. However, he does not. This becomes clear as the episodes continue. At first glance, and even at a close look, it would appear that Lorne is looking for permission to kill the man that has been the subject of the conversation. When in reality, he's forcing a state of change within Lester, as we see later after the fact. This change happens after their second meeting, which I will go over in just a moment. The next time we see Lorne, he has found Sam. We don't know how much time has passed, but we can assume that because it's still daytime, it's only been maybe one to three hours. That's so we can take turns. Yeah? Dad said that he also thinks you've got a potato brand. So, I... Shut up! You're doing it wrong. You need to press your forearm into the back of his neck, grab your elbow with the other hand, choke him right out. What, what you want, mister? Yeah, mister. What do you want? Sign outside says Hessen Sons. Which one's the older boy? Me. Mickey. No, so that leaves me in charge when dad is gone. Or not. Mom said the mom has nothing to do with it, sister. Hey. Help you with something. Sam Hess? Who wants to know? Me? Only two reasons to come to my shop, friend. Either you need a truck, or you drive a truck, huh? You a truck driver? I was just talking to your boys. I think the younger one's a little dim. What did you say? His IQ seems low, I'm saying. Have you had him tested? Hit him, Dad. Yeah, Dad, hit him. <clears throat> I'm going to restrain myself. You know, on account of you got an obvious head injury. Not beat you to death with a tire iron. But I'm going to ask you again. What the heck do you want? I just wanted to have a look at you. 
Okay. That'll do it. We see here the way he starts by treating the older son like he's the better, instructing him on how to best choke out the younger son, and then insulting the younger son in front of both the children and the father. This is also part of his chaotic nature. The children have nothing to do with this little errand he has given himself. The errand in itself is just something to do to pass the time. We can also safely make the assumption that Lorne has done enough digging on Sam to know what his connections are. Since he knows he's a freelance operator of sorts, he figures he won't have to deal with whatever the fallout is. Oh, what irony small towns are. We see this kind of behavior at the hotel, where Lorne speaks to the hotel manager and the young man in housekeeping. How many times I gotta tell ya? You can't just take the sheets off of one bed and stick them on another. It's unsanitary. I shake them all first. You don't have the sense God gave a clam, do you? Go shovel the walk. I need a room. Just you. Pardon? Is it just for you, the room? What difference does that make? It's a different rate for two, when if you got cats, Dog, cat, it's an extra 10 bucks. What if I got a fish? Excuse me? Would a fish cost me $10? Or what if I kept spiders or mice? What if I had bacteria? Sir, bacteria are not pets. Could be. Sir, perhaps you'd be happier in a different motel? I just want to know the policy. You see, I'm a student of institutions. Uh, sir, do you have a pet or not? No, it's just me. Why do you let her talk to you like that? Ah, uh, she's not that bad. Son, she compared you to a clam. Well, what should I do? Guy insulted me once. I pissed in his gas tank. The car never drove straight again. Yes, ma'am. I'm looking out my window, and uh, there's a young fellow urinating in the gas tank of a red cavalier. Son of a... Hey! We can see again he teases the manager, confusing her and getting her off balance. Then going and inciting the young man from housekeeping to act out. Then, right after, going and reporting his acting out back to the manager. Sowing the chaos and discord where he goes and for no other reason than his own entertainment. Again, this is another example of his chaotic alignment. We see this when he calls Sam's house, pretending to be the executor of the will. He knows the sons fight frequently, and he knows that informing the oldest son that the youngest has inherited the entire estate of their father will likely incite a reaction from him. And he doesn't know what the reactions will be, but he knows it will probably be a negative one. Now, the next time we see Lorne is at the diner, where he has another chance encounter with Lester, as Lester notices him driving by. I also want to point out that this scene in particular is a pinnacle moment where we see Lauren's philosophy on life.
again. Jeez. Did you really kill him, Sam? Oh my God. Is Sam dead? How you feel about that? Well, I mean, of course, it's, you know, a, a tragedy. Well, why'd you kill him then? No, hold on a second. I never. Oh, actually, you did. Remember, yes or no? I never said yes. Didn't say no. No. That will, come on. That will, in, in a court of law? Who said anything about a court of law? I just mean, I just, geez. When he had a wife, you know, and those boys. Buster, he put you in a barrel that rolled you on the road. <laughs> Your problem is you spent your whole life thinking there are rules. There aren't. We used to be gorillas. All we had is what we could take and defend. Truth is, you're more of a man today than you were yesterday. How do you figure? It's a red tide, Lester, this life of ours. The shit they make us eat. Day after day, the boss, the wife, etc., wearing us down. If you don't stand up to it, let them know you're still an ape. Deep down where it counts, you're just gonna get washed away. This change in Lester is part of Lauren's chaotic nature. Not only to sow chaos around himself, but also within others. Getting others to create chaos, all of their own and on their own. His philosophy is less about rules and disobeying them, but is instead about understanding that there are consequences for everything and for everyone. He is more often than not the consequence of the fullest actions others that have taken. We see Lorne a couple more times in this episode, but we're going to skip some of the less relevant things and look at when we see him about halfway through Lester's transformation. I'm going to pause here and say that my next video will probably be about Lester's transformation from a lawful good character to a neutral evil one. At this point, Lester is getting ready to set up Lorne to take the fall for his wife's murder. Lorne clearly has some experience with this as he not only records the phone call with Lester but takes his time to get to Lester's house not rushing or driving or doing anything overtly rushed by the time he gets there he sees the chief is in the house and promptly eliminates him after leaving he takes Lester's car and heads for his next assignment Later in the same episode, we meet one of the protagonists in the series, Officer Grimley. Grimley is on patrol late in the evening and Malvo is on his way to his next client, speeding down the road. Grimley pulls him over and here we have another interesting interaction with Lorne. While some playing chaotic evil would simply kill him and be done with it, this is what happens. Evening, officer. Evening. License and registration, please. We could do it that way. You ask me for my papers, I tell you it's not my car, that I borrowed it. See where things go from there? You could do that. Or you could go get in your car and drive away. Now, why would I do that? Because some roads you shouldn't go down. 
because maps used to say there'd be dragons here. Now they don't. But that don't mean the dragons aren't there. You step out of the car, please, sir. How old's your kid? I said step out of the car. Dad, come in. Dad, over. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. Officer Grimley. I'm going to roll my window up, and then I'm gonna drive away. And you're gonna go home to your daughter. And every few years, you're gonna look at her face and know that you're alive because you chose not to go down a certain road on a certain night. That you chose to walk into the light instead of into the darkness. Do you understand me? Sir. I'm rolling up my window. The reasoning for this is that Lorne doesn't want to leave a trail, and the easiest way to do that is to get the other officer to back down and feel threatened enough that he won't pursue the issue, meaning his tag won't be ran, and the officer will be too embarrassed to come forward as to the mistakes that he made. Even if he does, Lorne will have dished the car by the time they catch up. This ends the first episode of the show. Yes, I know, all that happened in the first episode of the show. <clears throat> From here on, we'll be examining points throughout the first season instead of just reiterating the same points over and over again. Throughout the first season, from here, we see Lauren make a few decisions that might confuse some of the watchers of the show. For context, his client Stavros has hired Lauren because Stavros is being blackmailed for a little more than 40 grand. Now that you have the context of this, we can start with my next few points. For instance, when Lauren seems to show some sympathy towards Stavros' son, telling him a joke to entertain him during their second encounter. This behavior by itself is not out of the ordinary on the surface. However, when looking closer, we can see that the implication is that the son will tell the joke to the father, Stavros, who will become irritated by this as he always is. This comes after the bodyguard shows up at Lauren's hotel, threatening him and telling him to leave town. The consequence of this is Lauren spending the next couple of episodes tormenting his client behind the scenes, making Stavros go slowly insane. We clearly see that Lauren has an intent with continuing the blackmail after finding the blackmailer. Using the son to annoy his father and killing Stavros' beloved dog and leaving the body for him to find. After starting his investigation, Lorne is confronted by Grimley and is subsequently arrested. Again, this is where he and the stereotypical chaotic evil make different choices. Whereas the, the stereotype would again simply kill the officer, Lorne chooses to fall on his cover given to him by his employer. When using this timid persona, he convinces the lieutenant of one police station and the chief of another police office that they have the wrong guy knowing that they do indeed have the right guy and that they are letting him go grimly follows Lorne frustrated and angry you have a blessed day How can you do that? What's that, son? Just, just lie like that. I sure hope you catch that fella killed all those people. I'll be praying on it. Lorne Malvo.
Did you know the human eye can see more shades of green than any other color? What? I said, did you know that the human eye can see more shades of green than any other color? My question for you is why? No, 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 just ho hold on. When you figure out the answer to my question, then you'll have the answer to yours. Later, this question is answered in the show. He was about to send a search party. Yeah, sorry. Cindy said Bill's on his way back. What happened? Well, they, uh, they let him go. Malvo. Yeah, he had an alibi. It checked out, but it's him. How do you know? Because I said the name Lauren Malvo, and he stopped, and he looked at me real funny. And then he said, like, a riddle. Is that about a riddle? Like, um, how come the human eye can see more shades of green than any other color? Because of predators. Uh, used to be we were monkeys. Right. And in the woods, in the jungle, everything's green. So in order to not get eaten by panthers and bears and the like, we had to be able to see them, you know, grass and trees and such. Predators. This shows how Lorne sees his own position. He's hiding to pounce on his prey while remaining hidden from his own predators. This is why he can change his mannerisms and speech as it suits him because of predators. This brings me to a criticism of the show itself. The two officers in charge, Schmidt and Chief Oswald, are two characters that I can't stand. Both because they are meant to be obstacles for the protagonist, but also because I feel that their self-destructive personalities are unnecessary to the story. Officer Schmidt is a narcissistic blowhard who is willing to destroy an entire case just to put himself in a better spotlight. Chief Oswald, on the other hand, is a bumbling, stumbling fool who received his position through virtue of seniority. These characters actively make mistakes and ignore evidence that you would expect from a novice, but not from someone in charge. I feel this takes away from the suspense of the plot, which suffers as a whole. I understand the need for having obstacles in the show, but the main characters, Molly and Gus, make plenty of mistakes on their own, that there really isn't a need for an incompetent boss in a berating asshole. That isn't to say that it makes the show bad. I am just of the opinion that it would be much more fulfilling to watch these characters chase Lauren and Lester only to be continuously blocked by their own mistakes. That is the limit of my criticism for now. Now after Malvo is released, we watch as he continues tormenting Stavros. Using Stavros' connection to religion against him and convincing him that because he broke a promise to God, these things are happening. Whilst also using Don as a means to assist him in the continuation of the blackmail. After getting confirmation that Stavros will pay the new amount, he no longer has any use for Don and locks him in a cupboard to keep him from getting, quote, cold feet, as it were. While Don is trapped inside the cupboard, Lord steps up an elaborate scheme, setting trip wires in a large rifle. The next day, Lorne releases Don only to tie him up to a piece of exercise equipment with an unloaded shotgun taped to his hands. Then Lorne goes to the large rifle <coughs> and starts taking shots, making it appear that he's trying to hit bystanders when he isn't. Then, having Don tied up and an empty shotgun taped to his hands, Malvo leaves Don again to his obvious fate. Here we see Lorne's forethought in his actions, as he even goes so far to explain to Don that he needs the police to stay busy in case Stavros decides to call them. This is when Lorne runs into the two hitmen hired to kill him in retaliation for the murder of Sam in the first episode. 
After having gotten the information of who sent them, Lauren first goes to see his own boss to see if he was the one who told them where to find him. Here again, we see calculating thought instead of blind murdering intent with everyone in his path. At this point, there isn't much left about Lauren that I haven't already pointed out. So from here on, I'll be talking about how to implement this in a chaotic evil character inside a D&D game, while making it fun for everyone else so that they won't want to throw you out of the building and not just the playgroup that you're in. First, let's go over the list of things that chaotic evil characters should be, but usually aren't played as. Chaotic evils need to be patient, charismatic, calculating, and always thinking of how to best maneuver themselves into the most beneficial position. Remember that unless, you're, unless your party members attack you, you don't steal from them, you don't kill them, you don't attempt to sow discord between them. These are actions that need to be saved to be used against NPCs and other enemies in general. Remember not to be an impulsive murder hobo. Your character isn't an idiot. They've gotten away with being like this for a long, long time. It wouldn't take long for large groups of people to just come and overwhelm you if you're simply killing every single individual that comes asking about you. Sometimes taking a higher price because you rolled low on a persuasion is better than threatening and leaving a well-paved road for any pursuers your DM might send after you to bring you to justice. If your character can't think beyond what's happening in the moment and doesn't take into account the clues from the past and maybe and the other clues around them and you're not taking hints from your DM as to what's going on, maybe your character shouldn't be chaotic evil. Sowing chaos is one of your primary means of purpose in life. Always use what your character knows to the best example of giving them the advantage. Remember to think big. Your character is the type of character to burn the world to the ground if they can't have all of it, or at least burn down what they can't have. Here are some things I think would help you play a chaotic evil character better. Be the helpful stranger. Ask simple questions and only accept simple answers. People are valuable, but not as valuable as time. Give helpful advice to NPCs and play sides off against each other. In conclusion, if you can't help but just kill everyone your character comes across, maybe chaotic evil is it for you. There are always other alignments to play. Keep in mind that this game is where everyone is supposed to have a good time. Whether you roll high or you roll low doesn't matter. It's how you make the game enjoyable for everyone that counts. Alright, that's it for today's video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I will have another one up as soon as I possibly can. Uh, please like, subscribe, notifications, leave a comment. Uh, let me know if you thought this video was good. Let me know if you thought it was bad. Anything I could improve on, just hit me up. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so, so very much. You are all wonderful. Have a good evening.